years. And then um, the weight area, the one that you were asking about, um, you know, I, I, in academia, even when I weight, you know, was younger and weighed less, I always felt, you know, it was one, as one of the fattest people in the room. I mean, weight and income are so closely linked in Western countries that, um, you know, where you see fat people is where you see poor people. So, of course, on college campuses you see thinner people, and um, people tend to gain weight with age, so younger people tend to be thin. So I was, you know, interested in the area of weight, and um, one of my colleagues kept saying, but aren't they unhealthy? You know, not aren't you unhealthy, but aren't they? Yeah. And this is something <laughs> I'll talk about today in the workshop. So um, I went to AWP in 1983, which was in Seattle, and they had a performance by the Fat Lip Readers Theater, which was this group of very fat women who would um, actually read, you know, their texts. And I was so taken by this that I thought, you know what, screw all my colleagues, I'm going to do research on weight and stigma and why weight is so stigmatized. So I, I started doing research in that area. Many years later, the Fat Lip Readers Theater put out a video and um, had an address and I sent them all my reprints on weight and said, thank you, this is thanks to you, you know, because they really mm -hmm. uh, got me started on that. Um, so um, at that time there was just very little work analyzing um, the research on weight and health, and, and I had to become such an expert on nutrition, which did not interest me at all, health, which didn't interest me at all, and dieting, which didn't interest me at all, because everybody would always, if I talked about weight and stigma, they would always say, well, what about dieting? What about, you know, weight? And in our workshop today, for example, I can guarantee you that somebody will say, well, I lost 50 pounds on this diet, and, you know, this sort of individualizing, you know, it would sort of be if you were giving a workshop on violence against women and somebody said, but I did ask for it when I was raped. I mean, you know, of course there's individual differences, but that doesn't negate the, the general truth. So um, so I was doing research on weight and employment discrimination and, and stigma and, you know, do therapists stigmatize against people who are fat and, you know, and, and in those days the, the focus was very much in the sort of health and medicine area. So. In a way, I felt like a fish out of water because the, the few people who were doing research on weight tended to be, you know, physicians, nutritionists, or psychologists really out there in the health nutrition area. And now it's really moved, fat studies as a new discipline has really moved into the humanities, which is great. So you have, you know, people doing um, literature and theater and poetry and history and, and so on. And then um, the, the lesbian area, I was editing the journal Women in Therapy and did an issue on lesbians and then just began to do research on lesbians. But what I often tell my students is it was so much easier to do research on lesbians in the, let's say, late 80s than it ever was to do research on women you know, in the early 80s. And I, I think that what was so threatening about women's issues and psychology of women was that I think my colleagues got it that if we began to let women in, you know, they would soon be in the minority, which of course has happened very quickly in psychology. Whereas lesbians, you know, they thought, well, maybe there's one in Vermont, who knows, but, you know, she's sort of studying this trivial area, go ahead, you know, good luck. So they weren't nearly as threatened by the lesbian stuff as they were about the women, you know. And that's why I feel so sad in a way that many women's studies programs are changing their name to gender studies because they want to include transgender issues and so on because they have no idea how hard we fought. And that word woman was always said with such venom. I can still remember my colleagues saying women's studies, you know, with dripping with, you know, venom as they said that word. And women was always seen as a very trivial issue. In fact, um, a, um, one of my professors on internship said to me, don't study women, it's too narrow. And you know, he was absolutely right. You couldn't publish it. There was nothing out there. It was a very narrow field. But you know, women was seen as a very narrow area. Um, maybe continuing on some of the discussion around like size acceptance, like you're very mm -hmm. involved with the National Association for the Advancement of Fat Acceptance. Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a bit about that organization and your work with it? Yeah, I, I can't say I'm terribly involved with them, but NAFA was started in 1969, and people forget that you know really fat studies has been around since the 60s, and they um, are still really the the organization that the media will focus on. You know, if you ever um, when a reporter does a really good job on weight or size acceptance, they usually will have somebody from NAFA, you know, that being interviewed. And what's always fascinated me is, you know, when women's studies started in the 60s, the second wave, almost immediately there were like hundreds of organizations and consciousness raising groups and this and that. And with fat studies, there's never been quite that 
um, exponential growth. So NAFA still continues to be really the, the main organization, although there's obviously others. So um, one thing that's always fascinated me is why has fat studies, or whatever you call it, size acceptance, you know, not, um, not been allowed to grow in the same way as women's studies, or, you know, even every campus will have a group for transgender students, and really there can't be that many students who identify as transgender, whereas probably every second woman on campus, if not every woman, feels too fat. So why has fat studies not really become such a, a big group? And I think there's a lot of reasons why, I mean, I think the, um, there would be a multi-billion dollar economy that would collapse if women did accept their bodies, for example. So I've just been very interested with um, weight or weight stigma or fat studies as kind of this, one of the last areas where, you know, you're actually legally allowed to discriminate, for example. Um, there's only, the state of Michigan is the only state that um, prohibits um, discrimination based on weight, and then a few cities also prohibit it. But otherwise, it's perfectly legal to say, um, we're firing you because you're too fat, or we're not going to hire you because of your weight, etc. What would you identify as some of the principal um, topics or like focuses that, in, in terms of the field of fat studies and within psychology, we should be taking on at this point in mm -hmm. time? Like yeah. is it does is it does it revolve around women's self esteem? Is it about raising awareness about these issues? You know, within the lar larger society mm -hmm. and discrimination. Like, what would you pinpoint? Yeah. Well, you know, you know, when you're in it, it sort of feels like it's everything. Yeah. For example, <laughs> I'm sharing a room with another psychologist here, and we were looking at the program and just the wording of some of the sessions. You know, I thought to myself, for the size acceptance caucus, it would be great if we had some principles about what kind of language we can use, just as other groups have had to, you know, be political about what language to use, say around disability or race or gender. Um, but, you know, it, it's everywhere. I mean, it, it's connected to class because so much so in, in Western countries, you know, weight and low income are connected. It's definitely connected to race. And people have said that, you know, we, we now talk about, um, you know, fat as a way, we're not allowed to be racist or classist, so we talk about, say, fat welfare mothers, which can be code, you know, for poor women, for example. So, um, it, you know, it's connected to violence because people, especially women who weigh more than they should, are often beaten up or traumatized. Or um, It's connected to mental health, obviously. It's connected to health in many ways. I mean, somebody mentioned at the workshop yesterday that, you know, fat women don't like to go to doctors because they're, they're given such a negative experience. Um, and of course to many, many things, the media and culture and so on. Yeah, so I, I see it as an enormous area that it really intersects with everything. Mm -hmm.